Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this Friday afternoon. A very warm welcome to the SUTD's inaugural Design Innovation Forum. I'm Corina Chung, Senior Director of Marketing and Communications at SUTD. I'm delighted to be your MC today. In the last 11 years, as Singapore's fourth public university, SUTD has emerged top among the world's emerging engineering schools. Just last year, we launched our fifth undergraduate degree program in design and artificial intelligence, the first of its kind in Singapore. This is on top of our four other degree programs, Ar architecture and sustainable design, engineering product development, engineering systems and design, and information systems, technology, and design. At SUTD, we are proud to incorporate the art and science of technology and design into an interdisciplinary curriculum that seeks to nurture technically grounded leaders and innovators to serve societal needs. Today, we are happy to be partnering with The Straits Times to bring you the SUTD Design Innovation Forum. In a world where design and technology play a vital role in our economy and everyday life, our speaker and panelists will explore how you can harness the power of design innovation to drive innovation and growth, to improve the way we live and better the world. First, May I invite Mr. S. Iswaran, Minister for Communications and Information, Minister in Charge of Trade Relations, to deliver the opening address, entitled, Why is Design Innovation Important to Singapore? And what does it mean for our businesses and society? Minister, please. Professor Chong Tao Chong, President of SUTD, Sir James Dyson, Mr. Brian Young, everyone who's joining us uh, virtually. Ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon, and I'm very pleased to join you at uh, this Design Innovation Forum. I think we all agree that good design is key to achieving good outcomes. The most successful companies distinguish themselves by designing products and services around their customers' needs and preferences. Design also prompts a more fundamental question. How can we enhance and elevate the overall experience for end users? This frame of thinking is not confined to the private sector. The same logic applies to the public and people sectors as well. For the government, our focus is on the welfare of our citizens. And our brief is clear to develop human-centric policies and programs, to improve the lives, livelihoods, and overall well-being of our citizens. This is where design thinking comes in. In a recent discussion with the Straits Times, I outlined two perspectives to design thinking. The first is in its focus. It is people-centered, seeking to understand what people want and subsequently delivering on their expectations through tailored solutions. But it is also a methodological process to tackle challenges, which involves inspiration, ideation, implementation, and iteration to learn and refine. These principles and instincts are not new to Singapore. At a 2018 speech here at SUTD itself, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong credited good design thinking for Singapore's progress. Indeed, we have always been open-minded and pragmatic in addressing evolving demands. Rather than be encumbered by ideological baggage, ours is a consultative and practical approach that begins by carefully defining the public policy issues at hand. In designing and implementing solutions, we continually question our assumptions and are willing to test bid and pioneer new and bold ideas. What is new, however, 
is the operating environment we face today. It is fast changing and growing in complexity. The pace of technological advancement is unprecedented. And these advancements have made our world more interconnected. Turbulence anywhere in the world can have unanticipated consequences for economies and societies around the world. COVID-19 is a vivid example of that. These shifts have introduced intricate, cross-cutting challenges that cannot be solved within traditional domains. The solutions lie in creative and interdisciplinary responses. We must bring together diverse capabilities and insights to unlock value and opportunities. With its resolute and consistent focus on placing people and their needs at the heart of problem solving, design thinking enables us to mount a cogent response in a dynamic environment. In that regard, I want to make three observations on design thinking from the public sector's perspective. The first is pot potential to unlock new and exciting possibilities, especially in the midst of rapid digitalization. The second, its ability to help us serve our people better and build a more inclusive and progressive society. And the third, its focus on consultation and partnership, which will be key, especially as we seek to emerge from the current pandemic. Digitalization has impelled our enterprises to reconsider their operating premise and business models. They must adapt to new ways of doing business, compete against disruptors who can leapfrog by leveraging on emerging technologies, and meet the rising expectations of consumers who increasingly expect customized and quality experiences. Against this backdrop, design thinking has the potential to unlock new possibilities for businesses as well as individuals and governments. Entities that make effective use of design thinking can reinvent themselves and gain a competitive advantage. In Singapore, we are well positioned to support businesses in widening their design toolkits. For instance, our Infocom Media Development Authority, IMDA, launched Pixel, an innovation space that provides facilities, expertise, and programs for businesses to experiment and build a customer-centric digital experience. At its design thinking sessions, agencies and companies can identify the root causes of problems, dive deeper into the challenges, and validate their prototypes. Secondly, design thinking and its human-centric focus enables us to craft more effective policies and programs that improve the welfare of our people. Let me illustrate with the example of my, ministry, my ministry's work on digital inclusion. 98% of Singapore households have access to broadband and own internet-enabled devices. Many have embraced digital in their lives and enjoy its benefits, but there remain segments, such as some of our seniors, who find it difficult to adapt and are understandably anxious about being left behind. Government is determined to bridge these gaps so that every individual can reap the digital dividend. We invited those who were concerned to share their concerns with us. Some lack technical know-how or access. Others were apprehensive about moving out of their familiar zones, their comfort zones. Their feedback helped us refine the problem statement we then launched an ideation process which culminated in the formation of the SG Digital Office. Specifically, we appointed 1,000 digital ambassadors who will be embedded on the ground and who are well-versed in different languages and dialects. And we also established 55 SG Digital Community Hubs in the Hartmans to enhance access and comfort for our seniors as they embark on their digital journey. At the national level, we are preparing Singapore and Singaporeans for a future invigorated by design. For instance, design thinking will be a core skill set for our workforce. In 2019, the government launched the Skills Framework for Design to help professionals move into roles such as creative technologists, and service experience designers. But we cannot 
deal with this and other complex challenges on our own. We need to draw deeply on the diverse interests, networks and capabilities across society and make it a whole of Singapore effort. Hence, the final point, working with partners to achieve effective outcomes. One example of this is the government's long-standing partnership with our institutes of higher learning. James recently remarked that good design requires the interaction of science, technology, and design. In offering a unique interdisciplinary education, SUTD exemplifies this by helping students gain mastery over these three core elements. More broadly, our institutes of higher learning play important roles in nurturing creativity, critical thinking, and interdisciplinary problem solving. The recently appointed Design Education Advisory Committee is one of our latest efforts to foster tighter collaboration between industry and education. The government also endeavors to work with our people to co-create meaningful solutions to problems of the day. We encourage active citizen participation in all phases of design thinking, from inspiration to ideation to implementation. One example of this is the Digital for Life movement which President Halima Yaakob launched last month in conjunction with the President's Challenge for this year. It empowers the community to lead ground-up efforts to foster digital inclusion so that all Singaporeans can engage in and enjoy the digital way of life. Similarly, we invite Singaporeans to contribute to the implementation phase by establishing a two-way communication channel for citizens to convey their needs and feedback, but also for agencies to collaborate with stakeholders to review their policies and processes as a consequence. In this spirit, we recently announced 19 Alliances for Action. These are initiatives led by captains of industry and executed in close partnership with government agencies. These alliances adopt a startup mindset developing and prototyping ideas within a period of a few weeks while simultaneously engaging potential customers and other stakeholders. These partnerships exemplify Singapore Together, an agile model of governance built upon synergies between the public, private, and people sectors. They allow us to examine problems through the lens of different ecosystems and, deliver, and it delivers definitive outcomes within defined timelines. This approach will be central to our efforts to emerge stronger together from the COVID-19 crisis. So in closing, I would like to emphasize that while we can never be certain about the changes that lie ahead, design thinking offers a valuable pragmatic methodology to guide our response. Human-centric solutions can convert uncertainty into new possibilities. They can uplift our people's aspirations and help us move towards a more inclusive and progressive society. And we invite partners across all sectors, from all segments of our society, to join us in shaping this shared future together. I want to thank you for inviting me and wish all of you a very fruitful and stimulating forum this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. With that, I would like to invite our first panelist, SUTD President, Professor Chong Tao Chong, to deliver the keynote on Design, Digital, Interdisciplinarity to Nurture Future Leaders and Innovators. Prof Chong, please. Thank you, Corina. A very good Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, this uh, SUTD Design Innovation Forum, and thank you for taking time to participate. Okay, let me uh, start by showing this slide. I think we are living in a very fast evolving world. Some call this the UCA world, which stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Now, this means the world will be facing increasingly large scale challenges. From digital transformation to aging society, cybersecurity, 
rapid urbanization to global warming, sustainable development, and not to mention the many unforeseen unknowns such as future jobs and the kind of pandemic that we are facing today. Now, these are large-scale societal, economic, and environmental issues. They are complex, ill structure, incomplete, and often contradictory, and constantly evolving, and involving multiple stakeholders, and they are all interconnected. Now, to address this kind of large-scale problems, we need new knowledge and skills, which are interdisciplinary in nature, human-centered design, and of course, a different type of thinking we call conceptual thinking, and of course, digital and data-driven. So, as a university, we have to ask, what is the role of higher education? This was a question we asked ourselves when we started SUTD 11 years ago from scratch. We were given the opportunity to reimagine higher education for this UCA world. And our aim is to nurture technically grounded leaders and innovators to better the world by techno technology and design. Now, to achieve this, we have, have uh, our own SUTD approach that comprises the three initiatives as, as shown in these slides here. First, human-centered design. Second, digital competency. And third, interdisciplinary curriculum that will integrate all these three initiatives together to nurture the technically grounded leaders and innovators that is going to change the world. Now, let me elaborate these three initiatives in the next few slides. Design. 20th century design was greatly influenced by the Bauhaus movement, which was established in 1919. Bauhaus movements have moved away from the heavily ornamented design, and they have a basic goal they call form follows function to unite art, design, social needs, and technology. And for, in doing so, it evolved from the handmade to the machine-made culture and elevate quality of life for the masses through industrialization, which is called mass production. Now, the mass production definitely has drive the world into very enormous uh, progress here. But on the other hand, humans will continue to want to have more comfort, more efficient, more convenient, and more material life. And therefore, the industry continues to have more mass production and consumer more mass consumption, and of course, rapid urbanization. Now, the consequence will be, as it was, you can see from here, is about environmental issue, right? Environment get degraded, and we have the problem of uh, waste management, and that all lead to what today we call the climate change. So clearly, the 21st century design must take a new form in order to solve this large-scale real-world problem. And 21st century design is to go beyond form and function, to be human-centered and address the relationship of human with society, culture, and the environments. So by doing so, we move from the machine-made culture to the AI and data-driven approach, which, of course, these are the new tools in the fourth industrial revolution. So SUTD has de defined our next-gen design as follows. Design, when powered by technology, is the informed, intentional, intelligent, and imaginative force that will drive innovations to improve lives, grow economies, and sustain the world. 
Now, it is SUTD aspiration to build a bond by house design philosophy to be the next Bauhaus for the 21st century to address all these challenging issues. And we call this design plus AI because the tools today we use is more than just a machine. It's the AI. And AI will continue to replace logic and form and function now will follow data and design will be with the brain, that AI power. So, in order for us to really implement design and AI, the next question we ask is, we must build the digital competency as a foundation, just like we learn mathematics. So it is not just one or two courses. These this are not enough. So in SUTD, uh, our digital-based courses are infused into all terms for all our degree majors. And you can see from this slide, our students will have this uh, so-called uh, opportunity, in fact, the progress progression to build uh, from programming to data, for example, understanding statistics and probabilities, understanding the analytical tools, and get used to how we interact with machine and learn about the state-of-the-art computer vision, like AR, VR, and eventually reach the level of AI uh, competencies. So now we have design, we have digital. The last piece is to put together an interdisciplinary curriculum. Now, in SUTD, we have five major. We call ASD, EPD, ESD, ISTD, and DAI. Now, these are truly interdisciplinary majors. Not just taking courses from two or more disciplines, but integrate them across the entire curriculum with the aim to nurture students to be creative in solving real-world issues by technology and design. So these are very interdisciplinary curriculum. So we do have a, a, a we call the foundation year, we call the fresh more, to build the necessary foundation for students to embark on this multi-interdisciplinary uh, courses and top it up with the final year capstone, which is actually an integrated design experience for our students uh, to work on real-world problems. In fact, 90% of these capstone projects are sponsored by the industry. Now, we continue to have key horizontal uh, competency, as you can see from this slide here. Uh, humanities, arts, and social science uh, becoming our very important uh, uh, so-called uh, horizontal competency for our students to have, for all students. In fact, 22% of our curriculum is in HAS, and we continue to have design and AI infused into the design project and also the curriculum. Now, what you see is just the content. The next step is how do we deliver them. I think that's important. So therefore, we talk about pedagogy innovation in SUTD. Now, we no longer use uh, lecture theater for our delivery of our content. In fact, we use, we call the cohort classroom that promote active, experiential, and peer-to-peer -peer learning. Now, this also promotes the important skill like critical thinking skill, like being able to be a good team player, collaboration, and communication skill as well. Now, we can't achieve that kind of skills or even attitudes purely just rely on classroom activities. So in SUTD, every Wednesday afternoon and Friday afternoon, we have no classes for the entire university. In effect, we return one day per week to the student and for them to pursue their passion and interest. And we have students build our unique SUTD EV car, and we have students that go to conquer a mountain that eventually the name Mount SUTD. Now, our students also have undergo almost uh, every term, so accumulating maybe more than 20 to 25 design projects. So they will have a lot of ideas and that is translated into uh, 
uh, entrepreneur uh, culture in SUTD. So we have a vibrant entrepreneurial uh, activities in SUTD, which is a signature uh, of, of a design school. So what about the outcomes? So here I have two sets of outcomes here. The, the one on the left is what our students say. So I just repeat some of these things here. They learn about design thinking, as uh, our minister mentioned, is so important now. And also the concept of learning to learn. Right? And they also, it's better to see the bigger picture. I think this is what we call the conceptual thinking here. And they also find that they can build projects beyond their own individual capabilities. So this is really necessary for addressing uh, this is a large scale problem that require multidisciplinary teams that come together. Now, we are also happy to hear what our employers say about our graduates. They say there are three distinct qualities. First, our students are eager to learn and take in advice from colleagues before jumping into the solutions. That means they look at the big picture first. Now, second, they are able to collaborate with Collab, uh, with their colleagues across the entire value chain. So again, this is about collaboration. And third, after creating the solutions, uh, they are able to enable others to execute them. That means they are able to lead the team as well. So these qualities put them in good state to deal with complex issues, which is the main purpose of having this kind of educational uh, experience. So to conclude, 20th centuries, the, the narrow or we call silo disciplines, as shown here, that this kind of approach is no longer enough for us to bring the world forwards. For the 21st century, we need a totally different type of approach that is interdisciplinary, that able to integrate knowledge and skills, and be able to help the student to develop innovation that the world needs in built environment, in products, in system, and in services. And overlay this with human, design, and digital. Now, this is SUTD to nurture future innovators and leaders to create positive and lasting impact for the future of mankind through the power of design. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Chong. And now, joining us from Copenhagen, Denmark, we have our second panelist, Mr. Brian Young, partner of BRK Ingalls Group, popularly known as Big. Brian is joining us virtually today. And thank you, Brian, for joining us so early in the morning where you are. We really appreciate it. So Brian's keynote will touch on giving form to the future. Brian, please. Thank you for the introduction, Karina, and uh, good afternoon from Copenhagen. I'm actually half Singaporean myself, so I feel very privileged to have been invited here today to share some thoughts with you on the occasion of the SUTD Design Innovation Forum 2021. And speaking of privilege, what I would like to talk to you about today through the lens of some of the work we're doing is the idea that as architects and designers of the built environment, we have the privilege, but also the responsibility to take the forces that shape society and to give form to a future that is economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable, a future that we would be proud of passing down to our children. This also means that as something forged by the specific challenges and opportunities in the cities and places we inhabit, architecture and design has the potential to be incredibly specific in its expression and relationship to context. So for example, in New York City, in our Design for Two World Trade Center, the low-rise neighborhood of Tribeca meets the towering skyscrapers of the financial district in a building that can be read as a stack of city blocks on one side 
but sleek and slender on the other. Further north at Hudson Yards, the northern terminus of the High Line, one of the most popular parks in New York City, is brought into the skyline as a series of continuous green terraces that provide generous access to outdoor spaces while also articulating the classic New York City setback in the profile of the building. In Shenzhen, we recently completed the headquarters for the Shenzhen Energy Company. And we asked ourselves, as the headquarters for an energy company, can the building itself be a manifestation of the best practices in energy efficiency? So instead of relying on the technology of the glass to mitigate heat gain, we have used passive design principles to create a zigzag facade that is opaque in the direction of solar gain and transparent towards prime views. So this saves 30% of the annual energy costs. And architecturally, what results is a pleated facade, a little bit like an Ise Miyake fabric that expands and compresses to create openings to the city at the base and social spaces in the sky. So seen from the north, it is a contemporary glass skyscraper, and from the south, a sculptural and enigmatic object in the skyline. And closer to home and, and closer to my heart as well in Singapore, we have been privileged to have the opportunity to rethink the tropical skyscraper with a building that brings lush landscaping at the scale of a tropical rainforest into its heart, a continuous spiral of greenery and program that connects the living spaces below with the workspaces above. And in a play on a classic modernist facade, the vertical pinstripes pull apart, allowing the greenery to spill out in a tangible expression of the social spaces that are contained within. And here you can see some images of the building currently under construction. And we really can't wait to see how it contributes to the life of the city once it's completed. And sometimes, the technology of something as simple as bricks held together by just the right amount of friction or clutch power in Lego speak allows for the translation between imagination and reality and the creation of universes of possibilities so that something like this can become this. Now the Lego house is the architectural realization of the Lego, Lego philosophy of systematic creativity. That systematic play with an open system, such as the very humble Lego brick, can result in new, surprising, and valuable outcomes. Similarly, while the Lego house is simple on the outside, just like a stack of Lego bricks, it contains an almost infinite variety of experiences and spaces on the inside. Now, from an architectural perspective, the success of the building hinges on the seamless and effortless continuity of space. There is not a single column in the Lego house. Because of course, you don't build with columns in Lego, but as you are well aware, what feels as effortless as building in Lego is in reality the resolution of an incredible amount of complexity across different consultants and disciplines. And the payoff of unadulterated joy, as evidenced here by my daughter, Elliot, who visited the, when the building first opened a couple of years ago, is what we hope everyone feels upon entering but it's also a good example of our mission as architects to resolve buildings, spaces, and experiences that span between tradition, context, and technology, and to make it feel as though they were always meant to be. And speaking of technologically complex, at a much larger scale, we have also recently completed Copenhill, a waste to energy plant where we have integrated a ski slope on top so that the plant itself is not just a part of the energy infrastructure of the city, but its social infrastructure as well. Now, typically these plants are clad as big boxes, but this one in particular is located close to the city center in a part of Copenhagen that is rapidly being repurposed from industrial to recreational use. Danes love to ski, but Denmark is also completely flat. So people will drive hours into neighboring Sweden to ski on slopes of heights comparable to this plant. So we thought, why not literally transplant a section of Alpine ski slope to the top of the building? Amazingly, we won the competition and here it is completed today. But it's not only a ski slope, it's also a mountain path, part of the biodiversity of the neighborhood, a machine for energy, 
and even houses workspaces as well. A building that is not only completely integrated into the social, cultural, environmental, and economic life of Copenhagen, but that has also transformed the sustainability discussion in the city from one of sustainability requiring us to reduce our quality of life to how sustainability can be harnessed by design instead to create a more vibrant, diverse, and enjoyable city. Now, the last project I wanted to share with you today, and this is something that is hot off the press, is something we have been working on with ICON, a startup in Austin, Texas, that is also the first company in the United States to secure a permit for and build a 3D printed home. 3D printing, a tool that I am sure everyone at SUTD is aware of and uses on a regular basis, just as we do in our studio here in Copenhagen, is essentially the next step in the evolution of the inkjet printer, depositing materials instead of ink so that three-dimensional objects can be built up layer by layer. Together with ICON and his firm called Space Exploration Architecture, we have been developing a space-based construction system as part of NASA's Artemis program for the further exploration of the moon. It will be the first extraterrestrial construction on the moon that will also be part of the gateway to the further exploration of the solar system starting with Mars. The basic idea is that everything needed to survive on the moon needs to be brought up, which is an expensive and inefficient endeavor. A single kilogram of Portland cement on Earth cost about 29 cents, but this same kilogram would cost $3,200 on the moon. So instead of transporting building material from Earth, we propose to utilize robotic construction and 3D printing technology that uses only in situ resources, lunar regolith, as the main building material. Now, lunar regolith is formed by micrometeorite impacts which pulverizes local rocks into fine particles. And it turns out that there are several advantages to using it as a building material, such as its low thermal conductivity and ability to protect from cosmic galactic radiation. The latter of these being especially important if you're going to live on the moon for any period of time. And here you can see some molten regolith tests that we've conducted to demonstrate its potential use as part of the 3D printing projects, project. Now the design of the habitat itself is based on a toroidal geometry that offers several structural and functional benefits, such as an optimal cross-section for achieving printability, material efficiency, and adequate pressurization. So the form of the future lunar habitat is really a direct outcome of the very different constraints of building on the moon compared to earth. And while the project is quite literally out of this world, what is really interesting for us here and now is also the potential to ap apply lessons learned towards more sustainable building on Earth. And sustainability is really the major challenge of our time. And while climate, challenge, climate change is clearly at the forefront, economic and social sustainability, affordability, and equity of access to resources amongst the various population groups of the world also needs to be urgently addressed. And technology such as 3D printing coupled with other digital design tools that you and we are working with today could allow for the emergence of new vernaculars of architecture that is not just about form, but also about finding new solutions that sit at the intersection of geometry, structure, material sciences, and digital design processes. Now, I hope the preceding examples have helped to illustrate the role of innovation, whether it be by technology, engineering, or simply rethinking programmatic relationships can create new and valuable forms of architecture and spaces. And I'd like to end by saying that I've had the opportunity, as, as many of you know, to participate in one of the final studio reviews at SUTD recently. And I've been impressed by the quality of work, certainly from the perspective of craft and architecture as a discipline, but even more so by the commitment to going beyond and imagining a transformative future for Singapore. And that's critical because as the current and future leaders of the built environment, you will not only have to answer the questions posed by a project brief, but perhaps more importantly, those that haven't even been asked. Together, it's our privilege and our responsibility to give form to the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. 
thank you for your example of building in the moon. And recently, SUTD published our research material to be able to build on Mars. So from the moon to the Mars, we can definitely collaborate together. Our third and final panelist is Sir James Dyson, chairman and founder of Dyson. His keynote will focus on science, technology, and design together. Sir Dyson, please. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. I believe the design used in combination with science and technology can solve the world's greatest problems. I don't often speak about design in public because I spend most of my time practicing away in a laboratory, but I am passionate about education and that's why I'm pleased to be addressing this audience. I believe that it's young people who are best placed to solve the problems the world faces using engineering and design. And I want to persuade you to do so, uninhibited by experience of how things used to be done, it's your generation that will solve the problems we face through your intelligence, through failure, and through research and design. It's your world now, and I urge you to harness your immense collective knowledge, ideas, and ingenuity with a mind to solve problems different to those who went before. Now, I don't approach design thinking from an academic perspective, but rather as someone who spent their life developing products and learning through failure. I happen to believe in the power of good design. For me, good designs rooted in problem solving. It's about function over form. And most of all, it's not about blindly following what's gone before. It's about forging your own path. Everything changes all the time with increasing speed. So experience is of little use. To be successful, we must not be afraid to pursue new ideas, to challenge orthodoxy, and to follow our own beliefs, trying to avoid the negativity of the naysayers. Good and truly inventive design requires brave steps, and it's hard for others to be your guide, since it's never been done before. And I didn't understand that when I started out. I also assumed that everything would become easier with experience. 52 years later, I can assure you that I'm no better for my experience. Every year, my belief that young engineers, scientists and designers will change the world. This is in part because of the inventions I see entered into the James Dyson Award. The award is about celebrating young designers and young engineers, giving them a platform to show their ideas to the world, ideas about solving problems. What's astonishing is their desire to make the world a better place. Ingenious ideas which are solving real problems with brilliant success. 65% of the James Dyson Award winners commercialize their ideas against a backdrop where 90% of business startups fail. We now run the award in 28 countries and have financially supported over 200 inventions. From the earliest days, we've had lots of entries that seek to improve life for the ill and disabled. But in recent years, there have been growing numbers of ideas for improving sustainability. Now, we award a sustainability-focused prize alongside the existing broader category. We've run the award for 15 years in Singapore. And last year, the Singapore winner was a truly impressive device called Kimia that helps people recover from knee injuries. I'm pleased to say that SUTD has also produced a national winner too. It's a simple yet effective solution called Wheelsome to help people transport goods on their bicycles with minimum effort. Perhaps one of our future international winners of the James Dyson Award is sitting in our midst today. This year's award has just opened for entries, and I'd certainly challenge you all to enter and to be bold, since the most successful entries are radical. History shows that the most significant product ideas come from engineers and designers with a burning passion for their products, rather than from people just trying their luck at being entrepreneurs. This is important. 
You need stamina and belief in a technology to make it a success. Invention is often characterized as a series of eureka moments, but it isn't really like that, I'm afraid. It's more about problem solving and failure, something that many education systems try to stamp out. Failure is the way to progress. It's important to experiment and fail along the way. Indeed, my life has been a story of moving from one failure to the next, learning from each one and solving the problems one by one. I often get asked what I consider good design is, and this is not a straightforward answer. It's about the bringing together of science, technology and design. It's about how a product works, how it is used. It's about creating a timeless product without obvious styling. Good design can revolutionize market sectors, even create wholly new markets. It isn't always immediately adopted. A good design may be ahead of its time and laughed out of town by those naysayers I mentioned before. The hugely successful Sony Walkman is just such an example. Dismissed when first launched. I mean, why would you want a tape recorder that couldn't record? But by the time production ended in Japan in 2010, more than 400 million had been sold worldwide, laying a path for the iPod and all the personal music devices. In a similar vein, I think the design of the Mini and Citroens also demonstrate what I mean. These may seem rather old fashioned examples, but I chose them for exactly that reason, because they have stood the test of time. Alexis Agonis, who designed the Mini, and André Lefebvre of Citroën questioned orthodoxy. They experimented and took calculated risks in their fields. I'm glad to see the Mini is so popular in Singapore today. But when it was launched in 1959, it was a very different kind of car. The Mini typifies good design. It was just 10 foot long and four and a half feet wide, yet it could seat four adults and their bags, and it drove like a go-kart. A whole 80% of the Mini was made over to its occupants, a fact made possible by brave design decisions. And it was a cult car that won rallies and became globally popular. It is a timeless design without obvious styling. I'd love to go on, but I've been limited to 10 minutes. My point is that good design, and I suppose design thinking, is not about blindly following what's gone before. It's about forging your own path, being brave, embracing failure, solving problems, and creating something new. It's about pioneering. You are setting out in your careers. I urge you to be pioneers. Make your own future. Move the world forward. Singapore is home to some of the brightest minds. It's a hub of innovation, a country that understands the value that technology and design brings. So everything is possible. And that's certainly what brought Dyson here. Good luck. Thank you very much, Sir Dyson. And we are very pleased to see SUTD students featured in the Dyson Foundation Award, as well as to have Dyson as one of the top employers among SUTD students. On that note, I would like to warmly welcome Sir Dyson virtually for a fireside chat, moderated by Mr. Mark Wee, who is the Executive Director of Design Singapore Council. Mark is physically here with us today at SUTD. And without further ado, I'll hand over the time to Mark and Sir Dyson, please. Hi. Uh, hi, hi James. <laughs> um, first, before we start, I just thought I wanted to thank you. I got my wife um, a hair dryer, a Dyson hair dryer, not too long ago. And she's been very pleased with me since. <laughs> She stayed with you. She stayed with you. <laughs> yeah. But I think I just have a number of uh, really questions from the floor that I wanted to share with you and uh, get your response from that I think, believe many people are very keen to hear you speak about. Uh, the first one really is about um, how many people in the audience today are anxious about not having enough experience to be as successful at creating something by themselves 
or to even secure the job they want. But yet you spoke of experience being of little use and being uninhibited by experience. That's a good thing. Um, could you share some perspective about that which you spoke about? Yes. Um, I've always believed in hiring graduates. And now, as you know, we start our own university and um, have uh, undergraduates. It's a four year course, so we have 160 undergraduates. And the thing I find is that um, if you're trying to do something new, something different, uh, you don't really need experience. Experience, experience teaches you typically um, how it can't be done or how it could be done. But if you're trying to do something new, nobody knows the new way. Yes, it, it was really that um, if, if you're doing something new, it's often better to have very young people, uninhibited people, people who don't mind making mistakes, people who take a naive, curious approach to creating something new. I mean, of course, there are some old people who are able to have that sort of approach, but a lot of people can't. Um, so uh, my point to the students today is that you don't need experience to be successful if you want to create something new. If you want to go and do in a job where experience is required, of course, it's very different. But if, you're, if you want to make a new breakthrough, you don't need experience. Experience can be an inhibitor. That's true. I mean, I also recognize your background was in furniture and interior design as well as painting. And that's pretty phenomenal, uh, given that background for what you do today. Um, you mentioned how good design is actually not about blindly following what has gone before, and it's actually about forging one's own path. Um, where or how does one set off on that path? And where would be a good place for one to start for anyone listening? Yeah, well, that, that's an interesting point. What I always say is you should come up with the wrong solution first, because everybody else in history and at the moment is always trying to come up with the right answer, the right solution. But if, you, if your starting point is the wrong solution, uh, a solution which apparently doesn't work or looks outlandish or looks stupid, of course, your initial idea won't work, but it'll set you off on a different tack. On a, on a different path to everybody else. Uh, so that would be my, um, you know, find something that is really bad, that doesn't work well, that really annoys you. It could be something to do with, uh, you know, um, getting rid of rubbish. We saw that wonderful um, incinerator in, in, um, in Copenhagen. Um, you know, it's, it's, just ha ha have a problem that really irritates and you, you feel really passionate about. And then don't try to start solving the problem in a conventional way. Uh, think of something that is a totally wrong way, but might have a sort of element of truth in it and start on that road. I see. I'll give you, I'll give you an, I, an, an example. I mean, I hated the vacuum cleaner back. I mean, this is 25, 30 years ago. Uh, and um, every vacuum cleaner's even, and, and they, they clog and lose suction. So uh, I wanted to try something new, and I wasn't a vacuum cleaner designer. I knew nothing about vacuum cleaners. I knew nothing about par particle and dust collection. Uh, so I set off on my own track using an industrial system i have seen on top of a factory and wondered if that would work in a vacuum cleaner. Now, I mean, a vacuum cleaner manufacturer had never tried that before. The experts had never tried it. And the experts said it wouldn't work, but we made it work. I made it work. So that's just an example. Yeah. I mean, you're famously known for having developed 5,127 prototypes over five years just to invent the backless vacuum cleaner. Um, how did you, can you recall any time you had to overcome doubt and uncertainty? Well, yes, yes. Um, I mean, you need a lot of determination, and it's really a life of failure. Uh, you know, there are 5,126 failures and only one success, the 5,127. And we, we do that all day, all day long, all year long, with all our projects. That, that's how they are. It's a life of failure. But, I mean, we, we relish in failure. 
we like it. It's much, I mean, failure is much more interesting than success. Success tells you nothing. Failure tells that something was wrong. Why was it wrong? Be curious. Um, uh, trying to understand why it was wrong and how you might overcome it is the creative, um, is a creative point. Uh, and it's the exciting, fascinating point. Wow. Most people would have quit probably halfway, right? <laughs> well, don't be an engineer then. <laughs> if you're going to give up, don't be an engineer. You know, you've got to have determination uh, and you've got to believe in it. And, you've got to, and everybody will tell you it won't work. All the experts will tell you it won't work. But you, you've got to go on and persevere. And it's, I don't know if you're um, a long distance runner, have you done any long distance races, but take the mile, for example, 1500 meters. At the end of the third lap, everybody's tired and wants to give up. But that's the very moment that you must um, accelerate. The moment of greatest self-doubt, greatest fatigue, is the moment you must accelerate your, your um, endeavors. And often, surprisingly, success is just around the corner. Wow. I mean, that really speaks to you as a heart of, uh, um, to the heart of an inventor. Um, actually, we know... Um, with regards to the James Dyson Award, what would you say are some of the most memorable inventions that you've actually seen coming out of the award? We've, well, I, I, we showed you some, um, and you saw some in the film. Um, the, 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 this, this year's were two really, really interesting ones. So I'll tell you about those two. Um, one was by a young uh, student in uh, Barcelona who noticed that uh, dogs can smell cancer. So she thought this was really interesting. So she developed a, a smelling device that could smell female urine and detect breast cancer. And her device smells it, and then the details of the smell go up into the cloud. And uh, with a university in the United States, they're developing this complete cloud of symptoms and potential cures. And apparently 40% of people uh, don't go for breast screening because it's very painful. So here is a, a form of diagnosis that women can have at home and link through the cloud with a whole um, metric of uh, millions and millions of experiences and know and be able to diagnose whether she's got breast cancer. Uh, so that's, that's a product that's absolutely going into production. And the other one was a, a, a student from Manila University, who um, developed a sort of waste fruit and vegetable matter that you can spread across a window. And uh, it doesn't need direct sunlight, it just needs light, and it can generate electricity. And he was, in, in the film we have of him, he was charging his iPad from quite a large sheet of glass with his uh, stuff spread over it. So, you know, one can imagine that over any building. Um, Built, especially those built in Copenhagen and New York and China with all those huge sheets of glass, that they could be generating a huge amount of electricity from the buildings. So th those were just two brilliant awards, two brilliant young people who worked really hard with, a, with an idea to solve a real problem, and they've succeeded. Well, that's amazing. And you guys are committed to helping bring that to production or taking the ideas further? Well, uh, in both cases, they're going into production without us. We could have helped, but in fact, um, and we're wondering whether we should, but there's a slight sort of moral issue about uh, having a competition that's uh, for, for, for students to, to experiment and then being seen to commercialize or, or, or get gain from it. So we're in a sort of um, dilemma about that. But 60% of the award winners go ahead and go into production as entrepreneurs, fired by their idea and the belief that, that, that we solve major problems. And I think that's the best sort of entrepreneur, not the sort of entrepreneur who just wants to make money, but the one who wants to do good, to do something that solves a real world problem. No, no. I, I think for many people tuning in today, um, those who really have uh, been working on something, to be able to hear you say that must be bring so much hope. I mean, what do you hope to see actually from all the budding inventors and design engineers tuning in today? That's more than 800 people tuning in today. Yes, well, you, you need determination. 
curiosity and sorry that. Uh, what do you hope to see from all the budding inventors and design engineers tuning in today? Ah, well, I would love to see them uh, select a problem, uh, develop technology, software, and innovation, whatever it needs to do it, and um, with great determination, come up with a product and make it successful. Because, you know, it's engineers that are going to solve and scientists who are going to solve all the world's problems. It's not grandstanders, it's engineers and uh, designers and inventors and technologists who are going to solve it. So, I, as I said in, in my talk, I just sincerely hope that every, every one of you here today uh, will take up the call to arms and do exactly that. Wow. Thank you. I know in the post-COVID world, the, the world ahead is really a blank canvas for designers and engineers. And I believe that for everyone who is uh, listening today to hear you uh, speak about the opportunities ahead, I think it just makes everyone just thrilled and excited. Uh, with that, I think we're going to wrap up our fire chat session. It's not quite a fire, right? <laughs> And we'll move on to the larger panel. Thank you so much, James. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thank you, thank you Mark and Sir Dyson, for that cozy session. And now we will move into the panel discussion of the forum. Let me quickly introduce our panelists once again. SUTD President, Professor Chong Dao Chong, partner of BIK Eagles Group, BIC. Mr. Brian Young, Chairman and Founder of Dyson, Sir James Dyson, and once again, Executive Director of Singapore Design Council, Mr. Mark Wee, will be moderating this session. So they will be discussing the questions that you have sent in when you registered for this forum. Gentlemen, please. Hi, Brian. Thanks for joining in. Can you hear me? Hi, Mark. Hi. Yep, I can hear you loud and clear. I think it's 9 a.m. on your side. Um, 8.40 to be exact. 8.40. <laughs> and hi, James. Um, we had quite a number of questions uh, who came in uh, because everyone was very enthusiastic and just so thrilled to sort of uh, just know all of y'all being present. Uh, so with really a sort of firm selection, I have a few. But I want to just uh, start with this question that would be to all of you all. Um, what personal qualities would you say are vital to being a design thinker or a design innovator, right? And really to, your, to uh, James, Brian, and Tao Chong. Anyone um, care to go first? Uh, maybe I, I can start. Sure, please. Yeah. You talk about the personal qualities, right? Yes. Uh, vital for being a designer, design thinking thinker. Yeah, okay. Now, I, I think in my talk, I talk about the uh, important thing is to have that big picture. Uh, that means uh, the conceptual thinking is very important. Uh, just like, you know, you, you are given a, a problem, don't jump to solving the solution immediately. I think maybe you have to examine some of the assumption and so on. So that's one important. Second, I think as a designer, you must have the passion that, that you have the desire that you want to make life better, you know, make, make the world better. I think that's important to have that passion because uh, we have seen many students uh, coming to the university. And I must say that, you know, not many really have that kind of passion that we hope, you know, they can, you know, have that desire. I think, I think that's important. Yeah. Now, the third one will be, I think, uh, when you talk about design innovation, you also talk about it being a disruptive innovation. So, in other words, I think uh, one must be not always, or I would say, not satisfied with the status quo and willing to try new things and, and we heard about uh, not, not afraid to fail. 
I think that's, that's also very important. Now, the last part, I think, must be something that is about human, that having the empathy, because uh, this is what human is all about. And we must have it because AI machine will never, ever be able to replace it. I think these are the very important uh, quality that we hope our, this, this uh, designer should have. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tao Chong. I mean, just iterating about the ability to be human, curious, never fully satisfied, and wanting to make the world better, right? Um, Brian, could you share what, what, are, what do you feel uh, some vital qualities to being a good designer or design innovator? I, I think what James had shared about failure res really resonates with, uh, with me and with our experience over here that you, you really need to have an openness to failure to, and to failing repeatedly, but to also have the tenacity to come back and, and, and to really explore that, that curiosity and to, uh, and, and to explore things to, to kind of their logical end and even then to want to, to take it a step further. But I, I think that openness is not just a failure, but it's also having a, a certain openness to new ideas because I think if you look at the, the, uh, the dictionary definition of creativity, it is essentially the ability to be able to imagine surprising new and valuable outcomes. So you have to have that ability to be open, that curiosity, that tenacity. Uh, but, but again, I think going back to what James said, I think failure is, an the, the ability to fail is an incredibly important quality to have. And I, and I would say on a daily basis, failure is probably what we do 90 to 95% of the, of the time. Wow. So James, the man who has failed 5,000 over times for the vacuum cleaner, <laughs> what yeah, do you think? I, I, I was going to say, if you're only failing 95% of the time, you're doing very well. <laughs> um, no, I, I, think, I think you pretty well said it all. Curiosity. Curiosity is terribly important. You know, why is something like that? What, what is it? Uh, curiosity about everything is, is incredibly important. Uh, determination by the bucket load, because, um, because of failure. You're going to have so many failures and you've got to bounce back from it. And even when you've made your invention or whatever it is work, people won't adopt it immediately. Uh, so you've then got to persuade people to adopt it. And there will be so many people telling you it will fail. Uh, so, so not listening to other people, but, but listening to them, if you see what I mean, is another vital quality. Uh, you've got to listen to them. And if you think what they're saying is right, well, then that's okay. But if you disagree with what they're saying, then take no notice of them. Uh, it's an odd bit of advice, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a good one, I think. because. You know, you're, you, everybody will tell you your idea won't work because it hasn't worked before. And then when you've made it work, everybody will tell you it won't work because no one's ever had that thing before. So you're going to have to overcome these naysayers and doubting Thomases, as we call them, uh, along the road. And you've just got to be strong enough to stand up to it and believe that what you're doing is the right solution. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, um, in listening to all of your keynotes, um, technology was obviously a very large um, influence and also um, ability to enable all your inventions and, and innovations. I just wanted to ask, what are some technological trends in perhaps your field that excites you? And in, in your opinion, how would they bring design innovation to the next level? And I say this given that uh, technology is increasing at a rapid rate. And in a kind of post-COVID world, there's a lot of reimagination of systems and all that. So perhaps could you speak about what are some of the technological trends that are exciting you? Um, Professor Tao Chong? Uh, right, yeah. I think uh, because we talk about the digital era now, right? So I think a lot of technology that we will be using today, I think will have to be related to this kind of digital technology. 
because I think the new currency today is about data. And I think even I, uh, I look at my faculty in architecture, they are using a lot of data to, to you know, drive their design uh, approach as well. So I think important, I think, is this kind of uh, digital uh, competency that I mentioned. Yeah, these are the, the, the competencies that you need. And also, we heard about uh, 3D printing. Yeah, this is another important uh, technology I think uh, we want us to have. And of course, there's another uh, important one is uh, we, we need to have more computing power as well. And that means that you know, we have to look at uh, uh, the computing power for, for intelligent uh, purpose, the AI chip, then the backbone, which is the communication uh, beyond 5G, for example. Yeah, these are quite important, uh, I would say, technology that we need. Yeah. Um, Brian, I know um, you all have taken, I know you're looking at some of the work you've done, some of the latest technologies, you've taken it literally out of this world, like 3D printing and all that, but perhaps you could speak about some of the technological trends the important to be up and go? So, so I, I think the, the computational design processes that we use now are, of course, uh, <clears throat> light years from where they've been even, even 10 years ago, just the ability to, uh, to crunch massive amounts of, of, of data. And actually, before I became an architect, I studied economics and, uh, and fine arts. And um, I, I was um, had delved into some depth into econometrics, which uh, you know is essentially about crunching massive amounts of data to identify trends, and, and I think that has also moved into the into the design fields as well, where we just have the capacity to uh, to process lots of data and iteratively as well. I think what is important in all of this, though, is that is that the human aspect of this is still needed because essentially a computer can only decide whether one option is better than another based on the evaluative criteria that you give to it. So there is still a very strong human component that, that is needed in terms of, uh, you know, from the perspective of creativity, the ability to evaluate outcomes. And that's also where there's a, a kind of certain intuition that's needed and curiosity to be combined along with all of the, the computing power that we that we possess today. Um, you know, but, but of course, this gives us a lot of abilities to execute and to deliver and to design more efficiently and in more detail than uh, than ever before. Mm. That's true, right? Now, the ability to just detail design with so much more detail and customization. Um, so, Sir James, I mean, in the world of consumer um, products and things that you all do? How does this question really? Well, I, I, think, I think the, the two big things are artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, machine learning, uh, we really put a lot of artificial intelligence into our products, in, even into our electric motors and things to, to reduce the number of components we need. But machine learning is the, is the greatest one for the future, I think, because it saves programming. It saves writing software. The problem, our hold up on all our products now is writing software. Uh, but machine learning gets around that. Uh, so I think machine learning is one of the key technologies of the future. Um, and the, the other, which is uh, people don't talk about very much, which is materials. We need new types of materials. And there's some very interesting material developments coming along, which can make a lot of things possible. Uh, I mean, not, not only um, from an environmental point of view, but, but for a performance point of view. So making, making everything smaller, simpler, machine learning doesn't require years and years of soft, software writing, software programming to make it work. These are, these are going to be the big breakthroughs that make our machines of the future, devices of the future, so much more powerful. Wow, that's true. Uh, perhaps I could have a question for you, James, and um, Professor Tao Chong. How might we better cultivate digital literacy and innovation in our students to actually encourage them to think differently and prepare them for the future, uh, given that 
digital and data is increasingly so important. How do you, would, would both of you care to answer that? Repeat your first part of the questions. Yeah. So I think this is a question really in the realm of education. Yes. Yeah. Around how might we better cultivate digital literacy and innovation in our students to actually encourage them to think differently and prepare for the future. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, first part is about digital, right? Digital competency. Uh, I think I mentioned that uh, we must learn digital competency as a foundation. Hello, yeah, it's a foundation. So meaning that you don't learn it like one or two courses. It has to be something that is coherently developed, that kind of, uh, I would say, mastery of the competency in, in digital. So I think we heard about uh, machine learning, but before you learn about machine learning, you have to understand the data itself. And then you also have to understand programming and so on. So I think this kind of... Uh, uh, sequence of uh, uh, so-called content that is coherent to uh, lead a student to understand uh, digital competency as, as a, what I call a competency is really is not just one or two courses so it would be uh, the foundation just like we study uh, mathematics I mentioned now the other part about you say about uh, attitude innovation innovation right now innovation I think uh, we talk about d design innovation here, lah, I guess. yeah. In fact, this is the most exciting word in SUTD. Lah. We all talk about uh, digital innovation. Uh, I think innovation, we already heard quite a lot. Uh, to me, for design innovation, uh, maybe generally there are three important components. Uh, human is one, always at the human-centered. Then we also look at uh, technology, because this has come together. And of course, the other part is the, the, the business aspect of, of the whole, whole thing can be a product, can be a system. Uh, so, for example, uh, we start the new university, right? Uh, from scratch. In fact, it, it itself is a very complex design problem lah, for us. We have to design in such a way that we can achieve uh, our mission, right? And the mission is actually to nurture future leaders and innovators. So I think, again, you have to understand uh, all these issue from not just content, but also pedagogy. Because the way we teach have a lot of impact on how we nurture the student in their attitudes, for example. Right? I mean, you have ability, you have knowledge, you can definitely do the job, but how well you do it is your attitudes. So the kind of uh, passion, uh, the kind of uh, can-do spirit, I think this is very important, yeah. Okay. Um, to Sir James, I know you are extremely passionate about education mm. and also involved in uh, universities. Um, what do you think, how do you think we could better cultivate digital literacy and innovation in the young people? Well, that's a very interesting question. I mean, for about 25 years, uh, my foundation has been working in schools, trying to make the, in, in a number of countries actually, the United States, um, uh, Japan, and Britain, uh, trying to make design technology a course at school to make it more interesting and more creative. Um, because what, what you learn at school uh, is to give the right answer and to learn it by rote. You're not really taught to think or to be creative, or to fail. Um, and I always think that uh, you should get just as many marks for failing as you do for passing. Because if you fail, you have the experience of failure, and you have to work out how to get the right answer. Whereas if you always know the right answer, you haven't really gone through much thought. And I do remember that people at school that always got the right answer first ended up being solicitors and accountants and things like that. And that's fine, that's fine. The world does need a few um, solicitors and accountants. But if you want creative people, you've got to create a different atmosphere at school. You've got to have an atmosphere where people can experiment, fail, and work out how to overcome their failure. Um, so, and I thought that the design and technology course that a number of countries have in schools is a very good place 
for um, young students to use their maths and physics and their creativity together to make things in the classroom in designing technology. Um, and one of the reasons I started, um, I, 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 we were failing in Britain because uh, Britain was taking less and less interest for various reasons in the design and technology curriculum in schools. So it's more or less dying out. Um, but one of the reasons I started the university was that I didn't want engineering to be an academic, um, necessarily an academic subject. It's absolutely fine for it to be an academic subject. And a lot of universities are very good at doing that. But I wanted to do a slightly different sort of university where um, for three days a week, um, about 47 weeks of the year, it's a full-time university for four years. You don't get any holidays. Um, you worked with very good scientists, engineers, and creators and designers who are creating new products, developing new technology, developing solid state batteries, fluid dynamics, um, high speed motors, all the kind of things we're doing. Um, so that they could be inspired that engineering is about creating things, solving solutions, and inventing things, doing things that have never been achieved before, as well as at the same time learn doing the academic part of engineering, which is entirely necessary, and which they'll feel more inspired to do. So, sorry, I gave rather a long answer, but I think it starts in schools, but it can be done equally well in certain types of university. So I'm not saying ours is the best type of university. I'm merely saying it's a different type. And incidentally, uh, it attracts a very high level of females, 35 to 50% of females, whereas the national average is about 12%. And I think this is because uh, females want to see the result of their engineering. They're not very interested in, in it as an academic subject. But if there's, a, 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 they're very practical, as an outcome that they can see, they become much more interested in it. And we prove that both at, um, in our university and the course we run in Imperial College in London, which is actually 50% female. Wow. Actually, um, as a follow up question, I understand you've actually started your own university, the Dyson Institute of Engineering and Technology. What inspired you to do that? And any plans to bring that over to Singapore? Uh, yes and yes. Um, no, uh, I, I've always been complaining that not enough people are reading, reading engineering in, in Britain, and um, where every year we produce 60,000 too few. And I've been complaining for years and years and years. And suddenly Boris's brother, when he became um, the uh, Secretary of State for Education, brought in a new bill and told me that I could do my own university, because previously you hadn't been able to do that. Uh, so he bought in the new bill, and ours was the first university under his bill. Uh, and it's, um, it, it's now passed the test, and it, it, we're now classified as a university. But uh, it's very different, because um, I was also appalled that the sort of debt that students are getting into now. Typically in Britain, they end their three-year course with a debt of £60,000, you know, £100,000. Uh, and this is an awful way to start your life. Go out into the world and start your life. So um, we decided that we would pay our undergraduates. So we pay them about $40,000 a year. Uh, and they work for us three days a week. And they do their academics for another two or three days a week. And it's a 47-week year and a four-year course. And they have a job at the, well, actually, they're, they're under contract with us. They have a job. They can leave at any time, and they can leave at the end of the course. Um, um, my goal is to make Dyson such an attractive place to be that they don't want to leave us. And I'm very pleased and proud to say that the first cohort, which is leaving in June, are all staying with us. Um, so uh, shortage of engineers, uh, feeling that there was perhaps a different, better way of teaching engineering and to overcome the, the shortage of engineers being produced. Oh. Um, we would love to, do, I mean, at the moment it's only for British people, um, but we would love to do a similar thing in Singapore, uh, based in Dyson, even based at the um, St. James's Power Station. Wow, I'm sure people will be very interested in that. 
Actually, I know a lot of people from a lot of students from SUTD who end up working at Dyson, right? Uh, perhaps how no, is we're SUTD? Wonderful. We, we've had a wonderful crop of, <laughs> of students from SUTD. We're, we're extremely grateful and happy. I think we, we also have uh, arranged an uh, internship and, and get the student even experience that kind of design innovation earlier. Yeah. Could you speak, Prof Chong, about perhaps how SUTD is quite different from the rest of the universities in Singapore? Okay, uh, I think I already said a lot in my presentation, but maybe I'll just sum it up here. Uh, I think first of all, uh, SUTD uh, is established to be different. So that's one thing very important. Uh, the difference lies in uh, a few things. Uh, I think I mentioned about being uh, interdisciplinary uh, curriculum uh, learning. So it really, we don't have the traditional engineering degree like electrical, mechanical, but we focus on what the world needs, right? So we talk about built environment, talk about uh, products and systems and services. So our curriculum is centered around that and that's how we uh, look back and then we develop the, the interdisciplinary curriculum. But because it's interdisciplinary, uh, we also make sure that you know our pedagogy will be very different from the traditional way. Uh, in fact, we don't use a lecture theater. We don't use uh, even a normal way of uh, delivering lectures. Uh, we have branded learning uh, coupled with uh, uh, some uh, activities uh, in, inside the classroom where students can immediately uh, apply and engage what they learn. And, and also, is there are a lot of design projects we put into it. Uh, for example, we teach mathematics. We don't call it like advanced math, we call it modeling of motion. So there's a very different way of thinking of mathematics. That means uh, we, we solve differential equation, but it's the purpose of modeling the motion, for example. We study probability and statistics. We don't call it, we call modeling of uncertainties. So I think this, this kind of approach is very important. Uh, to, to engage the student and get them excited about what they do. And then we have the, the set aside time and space for them to pursue their passion and interest. And that really build all kinds of skills and attitudes that we talk about. Yeah. I'm going to sh shift gears and ask all of you all a very human question. Um, and because today, one thing that kept on coming out was the thing about failure. So to many, failure is actually a very terrifying thing. But describe a happy failure and how you came to terms with it and why it was important to you. Um, and I'm going to, perhaps, Brian, could you maybe start with sharing what a happy failure looked like for you? <laughs> it, it's not hard to describe uh, uh, an instance of failure because, as I mentioned, we mainly fail. Uh, that is mostly what we do every day. But I, I thought it could be interesting to, uh, to expand a little bit about that, that topic because when we, when we worked on the Lego house, and I spent about six years of my, uh, of, of my career working on that, we worked a lot with the Lego Foundation, which is essentially a group of scientists, neuroscientists, child psychologists, et cetera, who had been put together by Lego to study the, the creative and cognitive uh, development of children, not as a, a justification to sell product, but really as, as a kind of exercise of understanding, understanding creativity. And what they discovered is that through the act of deconstruction of Lego, that children learn equally, if not more, than actually building the sets themselves. And, and, and this is actually very important because um, also, um, and, and maybe to put it very tangibly, Lego in the, the earlier part of the, the 2000s was actually a company that was losing money and going bankrupt. But it was also because they had made a series of very specific sets that were tied to uh, IP rights. So you would build them once, you would have a model, you would put it on your shelf, and that was it. And this was very different from when, when I was growing up as a kid with Lego, I had a big red bucket of, of bricks. The sets were given with instructions that showed you maybe three different things you could build. So as a consequence of what they discovered through the Lego Foundation, they actually reduced the number of unique bricks by half and correspondingly saw their sales skyrocket because suddenly the, the joy of creativity of learning 
had returned to Lego and to the, the sets that children would buy. So, so I think there's something very important here about how failure as a, a kind of part of daily life is equally, if not more important uh, for learning and, and, and creativity. So in, in that sense, uh, we do try to embrace uh, our uh, relatively consistent failure every day as a, a joyful and learning process. Wow. Thank you. Um, James, would you? Yes, I mean, I mean the, the, um, a lot of us learned our engineering by taking our cars to bits and having to repair them in the days when cars didn't work. And uh, so that the, what you learn from taking the components apart and putting them back together again, you, you learned how everything worked in, in the setup and, and in those components. So it, taking something apart and not being put it back together is a sort of failure, um, but uh, it, it's an instructive failure. Um, I had a huge failure when uh, I decided to build an electric car. Uh, it was a 500 million pound failure. Uh, so it's not, not a failure I enjoyed, um, but in doing an electric car, we learned an awful lot. So the, there was no outcome for us. So it wasn't a failure with an outcome, but it was a, a very, very interesting learning experience. And we've applied a lot of what we've learned into, into what we're doing now, post, post the electric car. But I, I just think the thing is that, you know, if you're in the technology business, you know, if you're developing technology, creating products, trying to do something different, you just have to enjoy a failure. It's an opportunity. The opportunity to, to discover why it failed, be curious about it. Um, the other thing is a lot of people think that uh, you, you, you experiment and suddenly one of your ideas works and that's the eureka moment. I think the, the most important thing to learn is that what you actually do is you build a prototype and then you make one change only and you see what difference that one change made. And then you make another change, one at a time. And only then can you really progress. A lot of people think, oh, I want to change that, and I want to change that, and I want to change that, and then it'll work. Well, it might work, or it might fail, but they don't know what made it work and what made it fail. So the iterative development sounds a very, very tedious, thing but it's actually fascinating because if you make one change you know exactly why it failed or exactly why it made it better and it's it's the most fascinating and exciting thing you can do because it's a journey of discovery and in the end having made one change at a time all the way through the five years or the ten years that it took you and you come to the point where you've made it work the excitement is extraordinary and the knowledge you've gained all the way along uh, is, is, is amazing. It's a wonderful journey. Wow. But you won't, you won't make breakthroughs by having a eureka moment in the bar. Forget it. <laughs> well, thank you for um, just even just sharing that. I think those are li life lessons on their own if we all could approach life that way. And I want to thank you, all my guests, uh, Prof Chong, Brian, and of course you, Sir James, uh, just for just being here with us this, eve this afternoon. And um, with that, we'll wrap up our um, forum session. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We have now come to the end of the SUTD Design Innovation Forum in partnership with The Straits Times. I'm sure that everyone tuning in have been enthralled with the insights and sharing that about design innovation, can, how it can be harnessed for growth, career development, failure, and more importantly, a forward-looking design-centric education is now more valued than ever. So it has been an immense pleasure and honor to have all of you grace this occasion. Thank you once again, Minister Iswaran, Professor Chang, Mr. Brian Young, Sir James Dyson, Mr. Mark Wee, and to all of you tuning in online. Thank you for your time, and we hope you had a great time with us. 
and have a great weekend. And we look forward to meeting you again for our next SUTD event. Have a wonderful evening ahead. Thank you.